morning and welcome back to season four of the Red Ship Poker Podcast. It has been a little bit of a break during a very, very weird year in 2020. And on top of things getting a little bit weird, we also decided to make a change in season four. I am back and I'm also joined by Chris and Zach has taken a little bit of a seat on this one. And Chris is going to be kind of filling some very, very big shoes. So Chris, why don't you introduce yourself, say hello and tell us a little bit about who you are. Hey everyone, so I am uh, Chris Warren. You can find me at CWAR on Twitter. Uh, basically, I'm kind of a, an old-time poker pro. Uh, I was a heads-up pro way back in the day, a two-plus-two-er. And uh, these days I'm kind of, you know, I'm not as professional, but I do play uh, for cash and play some serious games from uh, time to time. And I can squeeze it in between business meetings. But basically I have a, a big GTO focus, and I'm kind of working on a lot of that stuff for Redship and helping bring that to our you know our content so that's kind of my focus and really interested in this topic because you know my interest really lies in the gto and the math and how do we use all that to make the most money at the table so excellent and that really is kind of a super important question is how do we balance this whole thing between the really really mathy individuals and the really really feel-based individuals and which one is right? Which one is wrong? Do you have any immediate thoughts on that? I think it's just that classic poker debate, right? There's the the feel player and the math player. And I always thought it was funny that that was such a debate because to me, there really, there almost isn't a debate, right? The really good feel players need to have their play based in math, no matter what, right? You know, it's yeah. uh, picking off a bluff is to me, intrinsically a mathematical play. You, I don't think that there is the possibility to just kind of look at someone and totally understand their play. So even if you are a feel person, my opinion is that you, you always are based in math to some degree. What do you think? Kind of the same way. I honestly think a lot of the players that claim that they are purely feel players are just making excuses that they don't want to put the time into the math. I 100% agree with you that it's, you know, this, it, poker is a math-based game. And if you don't agree with that, then I don't think you've been around poker all that long or you're like really, really, really ignoring what is going on under the hood of this game. But it's all math based. And I think even if you're going to be a field based player and there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, if you can understand how to gather tells and, and use them efficiently, like by all means, rock and roll. But it's really important that you kind of fact check that against the math. Because a tell might say, okay, like your opponent is skewed more towards having a bluff. Okay, that's fine. But is it enough to justify given the pot odds you're getting? Like, it's not just as simple as saying like they're bluffing here. Yes. Maybe, but maybe not. Yeah, I think and there's this over glorification of the, the person who can just look at someone and know what they're doing. And I think the data kind of shows that, you know, yes, that absolutely can happen. I know both you and I have experienced that where we're just sitting at the table and it's like, oh, wow, okay, he has that hand. And I just know based on putting it all together, all these little tells or whatever. Um, but really like, you know, it's very difficult for the human brain to really wrap itself around, you know, oh, he might be bluffing 10% of the time here. You know, what does that, what does that mean? You know, I don't think our brains are uh, by default set up to handle that type of analysis very well. And for me, I, that I've experienced that, is that I've had to really work on the areas of the game that don't come intuitively. And in, in fact, I think those are the biggest areas of the game, uh, the biggest opportunities that are available is, you know, no one, even at very high stakes, typically four bet bluffs correctly. It's just not something that people do. It's It's a very challenging thing to do to look at a percentage of your hand and figure out how to make those bluffs and this is true for players who are very very good at poker um, similarly it's very difficult to defend your big blind uh, when someone puts a small c-bet bluff on the flop you called pre-flop with a wide range of hands because they ranged uh, they raised small which is all correct and then they put in a small bet on the flop with 100 percent of their hands how do you defend against that it's actually very challenging because you're going to have to take some hands that are typically not good poker hands, put raises in with them, put calls in with them, and force your opponent to make mistakes later on. But you have this very complicated scenario that's heavily math-based. And 
to me, when I look at poker in 2020, that's where the real opportunity lies at the moment. Yeah, exactly. So I think let's kind of skew that into a little bit of a conversation about like GTO and how that factors into things. So like when you're doing a lot of these GTO solves and you're kind of framing the conversation on like, all right, how, what kind of questions do we want to answer with the solver and what kind of exploration do we want to do with the solver? Like, how is that factoring into this conversation, if that makes sense? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, one of the first things that I do when I look at a solver is that I just try and go look at the spots that either I think I'm uncomfortable in or I look for spots that I might be uh, deficient in and just look at where my sort of instinctual you know, play would deviate from the solver. Um, so, you know, one of these examples would be, you know, three betting on the button versus a cutoff open, right? This is just kind of the standard spot that I've used throughout my entire career where I know I have an advantage putting in that three bet raise because players don't four bet bluff enough. And one of the cool things about the solver is that in that situation, it really validates the fact that I can three bet tons of hands because even against a tight range of hands, my opponent needs to be four bet bluffing a lot to defend themselves. And because that's not happening, I can kind of intuit that, okay, well, that means I can start three betting more and more and more hands until someone starts pushing back on me with four bet bluffs. Because even if they call me wide, which I think is sort of the, the default play, I still get to see a flop in position, realize the equity on my hand, and don't really get punished for making a, you know, quote unquote reckless play. And um, yeah, there's just so many little opportunities like that I, that I think most people miss when they're looking at a solver and they say, well, I'm just not a solver person or I'm not a math person. Yeah, and when it comes to this four betting scenario, you're right. I mean, like most players just like have so little four bet shade in them. And when they face that three bet there, their decision matrix is really between just calling and folding with like the slightest, lightest little bit of four betting. It's one of those like most people are comfortable putting in maybe the first raise, maybe the first re-raise. But yep. beyond that, most people are like incredibly uncomfortable and just mm -hmm. typically won't and don't do it. And I think also you said it really well, like people tend to call that three bet a lot. And I think because they've maybe read something like poker's 1% and they're like, okay, well, I know I need to continue a lot, but for whatever reason, that continuance just all get shunted right into calling continuance. Mm -hmm. Like there's very little foresight into, well, what about four betting more or four betting a lot rather than like only four betting Kings plus, which is what I think a lot of people just default to. And maybe they throw in an ace four suited every now and then, but yeah. it's just incredibly it's almost silly how few people just want to ever just hit that next re-raise, especially when we're talking about the four bets and the five bets or even like check raising post flop. Like a lot of people, they face that small C bet and they're like, all right, well it's between folding and calling here. It's like, no, no there's a, another very, very important option still on the table. And mm. I think there's a lot of value in exploring that. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this episode and you're interested in the type of math that we're talking about, James has just released a post lock workbook that takes you through everything you need to know to work out this type of math on your own, build that instinctual feel. Go to redshippoker.com slash workbook, and you can get it right now. That's redshippoker.com slash workbook. All right, right back to it. Oh yeah, 100%. And, and I think it kind of really, so for me, I really explored like, why does that happen? You know, because I think that's one of the most important questions. And I think it really, this kind of breaks down, I think, the barrier for me between the feel-based players and the math-based players is that it's about kind of how your brain works. And when you're looking, when you're, you know, say in the cutoff and you have your, you know, your ace five suited or uh, your king six suited, maybe some good four bet hands like that, and you, you get three bet and you're considering a four bet, you know, you're going to put in you know, 20 to 25% of your stack, usually in that scenario. It's so challenging to make your brain feel like you're doing the right thing if you put in a four bet there uh, because it feels risky. You know, maybe you learned about a four bet bluff, you know, you tried it one time and then the guy just called you and some silly pot happened, right? Which is actually pretty common in four bet bots. Yeah. Um, and um, it's very difficult for you to accurately perceive, I think, the right 
risks and the right rewards in that situation, right? Because you only need, I think, something like, you know, between 40 and 50% folds. And then you're also protected against their three bet bluffs. And if they were three bet bluffing too much, you now have uh, an advantage where you're getting some, where you're getting some extra folds most likely. Um, but it's so difficult for your, for your brain to be like, okay, this is the right thing that happens. And I think that's what happens when we look at like some of these very advanced poker players who sort of got ahead of their time. I think about like Durr back in the day, he essentially had this strategy that, okay, I'm going to three bet like a madman. And what's going to happen is that people are going to start to call me too much because this was, you know, 2000, I don't know, mid 2000s, right? Yeah. And so people started calling him too much because that was sort of, that's, I think that's the instinctual reaction. There's something about like, hey, I know what you're up to. Like, I'm going to call you and going to force you to, to prove it. And Durr's whole strategy, if people aren't sort of familiar with the history of it, his whole strategy was based on proving it, right? He was going to three bet you and the barrels were going to come a huge percentage of the time on every street. Yep. And it was a fantastic strategy. It was a, basically he broke the, the game of poker open until uh, later when someone figured out how to start calling more and look him up correctly. Yeah. And basically he would just run over people by having them call too much on the on the on pre-flop, too much on the flop, too much on the turn, and then they just couldn't, you know, finalize on the river. And you know, whatever they were doing with the range, they were calling too much pre-flop and, and getting lost at, at some point and just generating profit for Durr. So to me that's just that classic scenario of someone had kind of mastered their own psychology in a way that allowed them to make this play that was rather straightforward in, in a lot of ways compared to what we're looking at these days, you know, just three bet and triple barrel off. Um, it's, it's it, you know, it is difficult to do that, but it's not that complicated, which is so funny when we really look back. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I want to like highlight one little part of that and kind of the, the default response to, I'm going to force you to prove it. So I'm going to call your three bets. Yeah. And I think you can replace the action here with lots of different actions, right? Cause I think a lot of players will say this, like I'm going to call here and force you to prove it. But even that I still think is sort of an excuse. It's an excuse for, I think it's risk. I think the justification is risk aversion. Yeah. I'm risk averse to putting in the four bet. I'm risk averse to forcing you to prove it. Why don't I four bet you improve force you to prove that you actually three bet was something real and you can again replace this action with you know three betting against a check raise on the turn or coming over the top on the river whatever it is like so many people think that the proving a thing can only be done through calling and the more you do that especially on like earlier streets like you can gap some serious serious value on the table just by missing opportunities to be the more aggressive be the nutball you know take the dur option but just take it one step further can be really, really beneficial. Oh, I mean, I think that's the basis of most good poker players is finding the advantage in those situations. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking of the classic one where, you know, a Phil Hellmuth type, maybe you can replace him with the, the old man coffee in your game, you know, limps a little bit too much. You've been raising him a lot. He calls you and, you know, it just starts grumbling. Well, you know, you you bet on the flop or you bet on the turn, and he folds. And well, I'm gonna I'm gonna look you up one of these days, and you're gonna get caught with your your huge bluff, and you're just sitting there knowing that. Well, hey, like <laughs> you just gave up a pot again, and those profits are gonna pay for the time that I get caught with my hand in the cookie jar. And uh, you know, once you continue past a certain point, I probably know that your range is actually very strong once you've kind of proven it. And yeah, yeah I mean. For, I'm sure you actually probably are in that scenario even more than I am. So how do you how do you feel about the way their psychology works in those situations? Again, I just think they're giving themselves justifications and giving themselves excuses. You know, it feels better to say that comment of, oh, I'm going to look you up next time. It's like, no, no, you're not. You're only going to look me up <laughs> next time if you happen to have like a near nutish hand that you feel comfortable giving action with and you're going to continue folding all your marginal hands and... Yep. Like, I don't care if you like somehow open up your, your continuance spectrum from just top pair plus to now middle pair plus, like, cool. You continue 10% more often and you're still folding too much. So it doesn't really matter all that much. And I'm not trying to make it like ego oriented. It's just like the people that are risk averse 
are going to continue to get pummeled in every small to medium sized pot. And as the game continues to mature, when the risk averse person tries to make a big pot, very obviously with a big hand, like no one's falling for it. So your payoff potential goes way, way down. Your ability to win small to medium pots is still way, way down. And, you know, you end every session down a buy-in and a half and you saw a showdown once. Yep. Like, how difficult is it to beat that person? You just continue firing off and just watch them melt every single time. And regardless of how many excuses they make or grumbles they make, like, sorry, you're just not going to win very many pots. And then we can do cool things like, you know, size our bets down and not even mm -hmm. risk as much. And now we're just crushing even more edge, like there's just so many different ways to beat these kinds of people and especially in smaller games like these people are everywhere you know we always talk like the smaller games are full of fishier players and sure there are those players too but there are tons of these like risk averse omc types it's like they just fold and if they don't fold by the turn essentially like okay they probably have something decent and then you can just i don't know decide to overbet bluff more often <laughs> it's always kind of my option yeah, well, actually, it's that's such a good call out because I think that really is the opportunity in 2020 poker because I think the players who were really just reckless gamblers, like, sure, there's still some of them around. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of them have had to leave poker probably financial, you know, for financial reasons because that style is just, it's, it can be such a losing style if it's done recklessly without uh, any positives. Yeah. Whereas the cautious, you know, OMC, uh, those are the players that are left for the most part. Those are the players that are keeping the games running. Those are the ones who are showing up on you know Tuesday night. And having a mathematically based strategy that takes advantage of them, you know, for me, you know, having I went back to live poker in uh, early 2019, and my win rate, I looked at my win rate and I was like, I was expecting it to be a lot worse. And I was like, it might be a little bit better. You know, I think it's a little bit higher. You know, and then I, I typically have had one of the higher uh, theoretical, theoretically possible win rates at live, you know, live sample sizes, uh, yeah. being what they are, can't, can't rely on that too much. But, uh, and that's because for me, like I look at the game exactly like you said, it's just, I'm looking for inflection points where someone's not playing their range fully enough, or they're playing it too far. They're limping and then calling me and I can just really go reckless because there is no three betting there is no limp re-raising there is no four betting to stop me from executing my strategy and i may have to you know over time be more cautious as they start to get aware of it but that actually tends to create more opportunity on the value side as well so you know i sit down and i'm playing and i, I think this is probably even more your domain than mine but you sit down and you start playing a lot of hands because people perceive you as tight or whatever and once they figure out that you aren't, you just sort of button button it back up, go to your sort of more balanced default ranges, and then all of a sudden, you're getting way more action than you probably deserve. Uh, does that fit for you? Oh, that's that's 100% fair. And even more so with the beard. I mean, people don't know what to make of me right off the bat. It's, it's hilarious. But yeah. there is kind of that like ebb and flow throughout a session of like, okay, I'm, maybe I started the session super nutty, and then people are just like in crazy adjustment mode then I can just kind of like scale back and chill for a half hour or an hour. And I'm still going to get action if I get a big hand. And, you know, maybe if I've been playing that way for a little too long and people start making comments and it's, it's easy and live because you just have to listen, right? People <laughs> grumble and they look and you see eyebrows do th some things. And you're like, all right, well, they think I'm playing this way now. And then you just go the opposite. And it, as long as you're kind of like keeping your finger on the pulse, it's not too, too difficult to make sure you're kind of staying a step ahead of that. That's a very good point. Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting things I think as a as a I would say primary live player at the moment, although pandemic considered, um, is that I think basing a lot of your play online actually does kind of force you to pull in more of that mathematical base because, and so I you know I would say actually playing online is one of the most beneficial things you can do for helping to build that mathematical intuition because. You know, in live, you do have these enormous edges available. And like you said, you can sometimes just literally listen to people tell you what they're thinking. Um, and forcing yourself to play at least a little bit online where people are going to three bet you. People are going to make some moves on you. And, you know, I play on, uh, I'm in Nevada, so I play on WSOP. There's no, I don't even have a database on anyone or uh, large sample sizes. I have to base some of my play mathematically. 
I think that's a really good challenge um, to to force yourself to not totally rely on exploitative play and really just open up your your mind to it. And I think, you know, I know you you believe in this because you just uh, spent all that time creating this beautiful workbook. Um, but for me, really having doing the reps, have getting getting experience, walking your brain through what is the math in one of these situations for me is where I get most of my intuitive feel from actually at the end of the day. Yeah. So, and I appreciate the, the comment on the, the workbook. That's the, the post flop workbook that just came out yesterday as we we're recording this. It's just one of those where math is not poker math is not that complicated and it's challenging. Yes. Especially if you're not incredibly like inclined towards math or you really don't care for math and, and don't get me wrong. Like most people fall into this boat. Even me and myself, there's plenty of times I'm like, do I really want to go do math right now? But it's like, yeah, <laughs> no, you, you do James. Cause you have goals. And unfortunately math is required for a lot of those goals. So go do some math today. Thank you. Yeah. We it's don't just, do it before bed to relax, right? No, it's, it's, no, no. It's, it's work. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That that is math is my midday activity. I don't start with it, and I don't end with it, but it's some somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But it really is by doing the reps, and if, so like every spot we've discussed so far, like I think discussing like Dur, I think is like the great easy one to focus on. Yep. Think about the math required for Dur to pull off that strategy, just like in general. So a yeah. couple things he needs to know. One is you know blocker value when it comes to three betting and thinking about the blocker value of his three betting hand versus their opponent's range. The break even percentage and auto profit points on the three bet itself. The break even and auto profit on like the C bet on a variety of flops and how their range is likely to hit a variety of flops. And really because the major focal point of his strategy and strategies like that is just pressure, 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 where can I finally find someone's break point is really just looking at basic things like the bet size, what are the auto profit points, and how does my opponent's range likely hit this board? And be it a flop or be it a turn texture or a river texture, whatever. And a lot of that stuff can be so incredibly front-loaded. Like you do it between sessions, so that way during sessions you're like, oh, I know what to do. And I think that actually lends itself to the key point you said or you were asking earlier is like, you know, feeling comfortable doing this stuff, pulling these kinds of triggers. It's by doing these kind of reps between sessions. So that way when you are in a session, you're not sitting there having to like pull out your mental calculator or pull out your fingers and figuring out what the hell is the break even percentage of this bet. Rather yeah. like you kind of have a ballpark for it. Is it perfect? No. Are you to a tenth of a decimal place? Most certainly not. But are you in the ballpark? Can you eyeball it? Are you close? Are you plus or minus 10% of the right answer? Because if so, you are doing so much better than your opponents who aren't doing any of this kind of work. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it really does come down to just slowly walking yourself through. You know, like uh, back in the day, you know, when I started, two thousand. Uh, you know, I think you and I kind of became professional around two thousand six, approximately. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't have solvers. We didn't have like all these tools that are available now. I would just sit down a notepad and go, okay, what do I think the range is in this spot? What you know how much of that are they going to fold to the various size bets? That was it, you know? And off the back of that, I was able to build a professional career, essentially. Um, and I think things are, you know, seemingly more complicated now, but you also have so much more software support. You know, I was just doing essentially back of the napkin math back in the day and able to play, you know, mid, mid stakes pokers very successfully with one of the higher win rates. But, you know, these days, like, how difficult is it to, you know, look at someone's four bet range in a solver and say, okay, if they're not four betting ace five suited, if they're not, you know, maybe turning a lot of their ace queen suits into four bets when I three bet them on the button, I can just start three betting fairly recklessly. And like, you know, it's, um, I suspect back in the day, Dur didn't even do complicated math. I think he just kind of figured out that like, hey, if I three bet, you know, the button and then just like bet the whole way, I don't know when he's going to drop off, but he'll drop off somewhere, right? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think it was super complicated. And, you know, I think people get scared all the, you know, when you start bringing those numbers in. But like you said, you don't need to be exact. You just need to have a sense of where things are at. And then 
when you have a sense of where things are at, find those big opportunities, find those juicy situations that are just like, yeah, when someone limps and you ISO raise them, like they essentially can't defend it, right? So you need to be very aggressive. You know, what are those situations that you can look at? And the math will tell you what's available in your game. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I remember early on doing a tremendous amount of work like this with you. And, you know, back then, I think you were just using notepad docs. I know I was using poker stove a ton. Mm -hmm. And poker stove is really helpful. And poker stove is essentially like today's version of Equilab. It was perfect because I could visualize the range. I'm such a, a visual person. I needed to be able to visualize a range and then start taking like the technical elements from that, right? Like how many hands are actually included here and what's the percentage of all possible hands. And that that helped a tremendous amount. And now with, you know, the software we have and not just solvers, I mean, even just like Flopzilla Pro, like there's, it's so easy for visual people. I mean, now Flopzilla Pro actually has the pie chart baked right into it. I mean, it, it's never mm -hmm. been easier to start taking some of this complex work and start letting some of it just seep into you. Because that's what we're looking for is, is developing that intuition between sessions, you know, being more technically focused, yes, but that way in real time, again, we're not to the 10th of a decimal place, but I have a ballpark, I have like a mental uh, library to pull from and say, okay, like it's probably in this ballpark, you know, does it matter if it's 54.5% or 56? Not really. All that matters is that I'm in the ballpark and especially if they're not going to end up raising very much, I mean, it gets even better for us. You know, the, the raising them, our opponents being aggressive throws a major wrench into the system. But mm -hmm. the less and less they do that, like, the more and more I can kind of, like, get a little blurry on those fringes and, you know, take a couple of cusps off that maybe I wasn't taking against other players. Yeah, yeah that's a fantastic point. I think, actually, what's funny is I actually like to try and create a lot of heuristics from the math. So like you said, it's like, I'm actually looking for situations that my opponent won't be aggressive. And so I might actually have a very aggressive opponent. So, you know, we're, I'm three betting him and he has shown that he can four bet me and, you know, we're battling now, let's say, and we get to a flop and it's an ace high board and it's dry and I three bet him pre-flop and I'm in position. I just know sometimes with these type of people, you might not get check raised on that flop with air, right? That just may not, you know, they're comfortable kind of playing the three bet four bet game because they've, they've developed that feel, but they just don't understand that on an ace high board, they can come after you. So maybe I put in my little, you know, 25% or 30% bet on that flop. And yeah, he'll call it a lot. Maybe he'll call me with king high or some gut shots and things like that, but he's never check raising me. And I just know as a heuristic, anytime I'm never, I'm not getting aggression back at me, is a time that I can push the envelope, like you said. That's, that's and, and I just know any time, and it comes up dynamically now because it's like, you know, I don't know like that player type doesn't check raise on an ace high board. I might have a sense of that in the game though, having seen him play post lot that like, oh yeah, like the check raises just aren't coming in. Like that's just not something that he does. And uh, yeah, so I mean, for me, it's all about taking that math and then putting it in a form that I know I'm gonna be able to remember, I'm gonna be able to use at the table, and I'm gonna be able to implement. Yep. But there, therein lies kind of an interesting dilemma for the whole thing is just how badly our brains suck at probability, yeah. right? Like how, how difficult is it to, cause like you gotta be paying a good chunk of attention to realize that there are not check raises coming in on specific textures. And also then you can drill in even further and say, okay, like it's maybe it's not coming in on ace nine deuce, but it is going to come in on ace nine seven, right? And like, how do you mentally bucket for that and make sure that you don't over or under, you know, uh, apply these, these assumption sets across. So do you have any like ways that you kind of balance that? Cause that's kind of just something that we all kind of suck with is keeping track of things, being super, super objective with things and making sure that we're not like over extrapolating or most likely under extrapolating. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, and honestly, I, yeah, that's kind of the, the core of how do you use a solver output? And for me, you know, the starting point is always like, what do I think the balanced GTO baseline is? 
And so, you know, a lot of that will come from uh, either just lots of experience and, you know, thinking about the game carefully or, or using some solvers. And, um, and this is one of the reasons I like solvers is that it, it kind of tells you where gravity should be. And so if I look at that solver and I'm like, okay, like he needs to be check raising me with his ace queen on the ace high board and things like that. And then you're never usually, you know, in most 2020 poker situations, unless you're playing on, you know, a large database poker site, like poker stars or something, um, you're not going to have that detailed information. You're not going to be like, or even be able to remember, let's say if he, you saw him check raise on a certain board texture or whatever, you just start to get a, a sample size of maybe how they might think about the game. And then if you use that in combination with where is gravity, that's where you really find the mathematical edge. And so, you know, very frequently on that ace nine two board, I'm going to put in a small bet because I know players in general are not comfortable check raising on that board because it's like, they don't want to check raise their ace. They want to bluff catch with their ace. They just, you know, if they have the set, they want you to barrel off because you just bet small. There's just so many reasons pushing people towards uh, the passive lines in that scenario. And what's funny too is actually when I do get check raises on the board, I get very suspicious and just float it for whatever reason frequently because I'm like, well, you're not check raising your ace here. So what are we dealing with? Like, are you really just on sets right now? Like, I don't think so. Um, yep. And so you can kind of use that gravity based GTO baseline to kind of really create a situation where you you're benefiting in aggregate, you know? And I think, like you said, that's always the challenge with your brain is that like, you know, I might just float your, your little flop check raise on ace nine two with whatever I have just to see that like, okay, like if you have sets, I know you're going to ha have to really barrel on the turn here because you think I have, you know, the ace now. And if you don't follow through on that, well, now I can just put in a little bet and make you fold your garbage. <laughs> And that isn't a play that like, I remember the first time I made that play, like I didn't plan it out. I didn't, you know, look for this situation. It was just really based in the fact that I had a very good feel for where people were going with their ranges on this board. And obviously that came from, you know, many hours in notepad and, and all the GTO baselines and things like that. But at the end of the day, I was able to use that in the moment dynamically and apply it at the table. And I think that's really what everyone's looking for is you, you, you want to be a field-based player, but you need to have it based in that math intuition. Yeah, I 100% agree. And to your point earlier, like part of the benefit of playing online or challenge, I suppose, depends on how you look at it, is that you don't mm -hmm. have this copious amount of extra information, right? When you're playing mm -hmm. live, listening, I mean, you can get so much information just by keeping your ears open versus online you don't have that which then forces you to kind of revert back to gravity i've always kind of considered it my back pocket strategy like what do i fall back on when i don't have other information and when we're playing really really exploitative right we're purely focused on our opponent we're purely figured out or figuring out where are the weaknesses in their strategy and how can i just absolutely hammer pressure endlessly against this individual you know when you don't have that kind of information or you're new to a table or this person just playing a little bit tricky. It's difficult to get a, a pure read on it, you know, reverting back to solver output and kind of the general back pocket strategy is extremely helpful. Otherwise, what are you doing? And that's where I think a lot of like exploitative players get really lost is okay. I don't have the info now. Yes. What? Yeah. And actually I think that's a really good point to kind of let's make it bigger picture and really simplify, you know, poker at the highest level in almost every situation you know dealing with like 100 big blind stacks you need to have some bluffs that's that's your biggest baseline ever so when you know when you look at a situation and you know your your opponent's three betting you and you're coming with the four bet you should know intuitively in that situation you need to have some bluffs you know you don't necessarily have to know right off what they are you know like sometimes in that situation if i'm getting three bet by a tight range in a live game I might just say, okay, I don't know how many bluffs that I'm supposed to have here. I'm just going to always have ace king suited to be my bluff here because first of all, I know I need some. Second of all, it's hard to get worse than, than you know, ace king suited, right? So even if uh, I'm dealing with someone who's going to call me too much and things like that, I now have my bluffing hand. 
and then you know I, I might decide okay maybe I need another one and I can you know include ace queen suited or ace five suited depending on you know the things but it, at the end of the day really what I know is I need some bluffs and so if I think I'm getting three bet you know very tight like queens plus or something like that I can still bluff them with ace king suited and really I would say look for those big simple ideas to start always have some bluffs have some bluffs in your post op range uh, look for really common scenarios you know the the in position c bet is one of the most common ones we know if someone has called with wide range preflop you're in position and they're out of position and you put a small bet on the flop it's very difficult to defend that it just is because it means you need to be floating your gut shots you need to be check raising some of your strong top pairs uh, it's just a difficult situation to handle that almost no one handles correctly and so i can just put in a little c bet whenever i'm unsure with 100 percent of my hands right and over time you know that may not be the perfect strategy but i just oh no over time i'm creating a more difficult scenario for my opponent then I have had to make a decision on my end. And looking at those be beginning spots, I think will help you start to learn and really understand the power of this type of uh, approach is that you actually don't need to do anything crazy. You can just make sure you have a bluff here and there. You can uh, just look at a spot where your opponent will have an incredibly difficult time playing correctly. Those are the situations where you will make the overwhelming majority of your profit. And of course, poker is this beautiful complicated game where we can get very deep into post-op scenarios and play crazy hands but at the you know small stakes games you really only need a few of these plays before you're really crushing as a winning player yeah i think that's 100 percent fair and i don't know I, I love this this kind of conversation this kind of thought and w one of the things that comes to mind i mean you and i have been talking a lot more gto recently and i've been using solvers for a while now but you know there's this like natural friction up front of like do i really want to do this like is mm. my opponent really using this range like if i'm not even comfortable with that or if i'm not 100 percent sure what my range looks like in this spot like how the heck am i going to trust the solver output which is purely based upon this exact range and their exact range you know, anytime someone brings a solver finding to me or I find one on my own, like the first thing I do is just pull out basic math. And honestly, I'm like, okay, like, why is this happening this way? And then I'll just like, okay, what's the break even point on this bet that the solver is working with at this moment? And okay, that's, that's why this might be happening. Or I've just run it through Flopzilla Pro and say, okay, like, oh, this range is missing a tremendous amount here. Or here's like the weakest of the hands that the solver is saying to continue with. So you're kind of like starting to bridge the gap from this like purely theoretical GTO solver output, which can just get a little or feel a little overwhelming with the math, which is incredibly, incredibly concrete and never changing compared to the exploitative stuff. So I've, I found that helpful to try to bridge the gap between, OK, cool, here's a solver output that's incredibly complex and I'm never going to be able to shade my, you know, this exact combo to a hundredth of a decimal place. But by putting some general math behind it, I'm like, okay, now, now I can at least understand kind of where some of these patterns are coming from and why the solver might be saying X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important call out is that at the end of the day, solvers are just tools to teach us things that we need. They're simulations of non-real poker games and almost no poker games at this point uh, function anywhere close to a solver. And because of that, you know, we are applying this in reality and you know tools like your workbook where you really start to understand how to build these ranges and teach yourself how to work through one of these problems or work through one of these situations mathematically and some of the things that we're developing on redship where we're going to be walking you through you know what does a range c bet do for you why can you c bet you know a small amount in position so frequently and and not get punished in the current games and uh yeah, they, they really are tools to teach yourself. And by getting familiar with these tools, you just really open up the possibilities for yourself in poker. And, and I know it can be intimidating, but even just getting started can teach you some incredible things that you just wouldn't otherwise understand. Yeah. 
And, and that's that's exactly it. Whether you're using a solver, whether you're just doing your own exploration, whether you're using a workbook, whatever it is, it's to do these reps and analyze the output and try to discern the patterns. Because you can memorize the patterns or at least intuit them. And when you're in real time, you know, trying to figure out exactly what you should do in a situation, you can revert back to, okay, yes, this is a pattern. This is the situation that matches up with that. And I know I can do X, Y, or Z rather than just trying to figure out everything on the fly and saying, well, everything's unique. You know, every single spot is a snowflake. Okay, sure, yes, there may be slight differences in ranges and the texture might be slightly different, whatever, but it's still very similar to this bunch of other things that you've analyzed and you can just pull from that rather than feeling like all this is wasted because every single situation is broadly unique. In fact, that was one of the things that kind of made me really hesitant about solvers is just because it's like okay cool i have a solver output for this like extremely specific spot awesome now what when the spot comes off you know plus one removed to the left and, and then when i started looking at it from the pattern output it's like oh okay got it that makes a lot more sense yep yep no i i completely agree it's uh it's so funny that you're mentioning that is actually one of the approaches that we're taking for some of the uh the Redshift Pro solver material that we're working on is we're actually taking you know exactly the same runs and comparing them. So we have like a 10 element run where we we set the poker stars rake up and then we compare that to a 100 element run and you know which hands are profitable play and which scenarios and how everything is impacted. It's really interesting just to see like oh like you know what like 10 element and 100 element from a game theoretically optimal perspective they don't change that much we're talking you know between four and eight combos difference in uh an under the gun opening raising range at six max or something like that now that's not nothing but really just understanding mathematically that we can actually compare these situations uh, we can compare you know looking at a board te- or even just maybe all flops you know what is a hundred percent c bet in position for 30 percent of the pot compared to uh, you know, that complicated, you know, checking 30% of flops on average and, you know, having a whole mixed strategy. And we look at that and it's like, you know, the difference in profit is like a hundredth of a BB. And knowing, oh, interesting, you know, the math says there's not a huge difference here. But in reality, we may know there is because, you know, people are going to make mistakes folding. So why we actually probably want to exploitatively bet 100% of the time and we can we can use those comparisons and the math to really yeah it, you're just seeing a level of poker that everyone else won't be seeing and won't be playing on and it's not nearly as intimidating and I think that's the beauty of what we're working on is that you know we, you and I are, are really developing the tools to help someone totally new to the game enter and start seeing what is really happening and and what the building blocks are yeah exactly and just how to really start building that back pocket strategy. So you feel confused less. I mean, that's I think where where a lot of people just kind of hate life with this game is not really a fact that it's kind of math based, even though that's very, very true. I think they just hate feeling confused, right? Mm -hmm. I think most people are risk averse and they're smart and especially ones that have been around this game for a while, but they hate that feeling of confusion. So that mandates that you have some sort of back pocket strategy to eliminate yes. that confusion. It's not going to eliminate it entirely. It's not like you're ever going to see someone like step out of it and all of a sudden like they overbet the flop for like 1.7x and you were expecting them to see bet for like 40%. You're like, well, what the heck now? That will happen for sure. But at least you had a stronger starting point for your preflop stuff. You had a stronger starting point for your flop C betting. And now facing that check raise, well, you have the math. So you can at least look at what your pot odds are right this moment. And you can still continue the overall analysis. It just forks a little bit. But that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. And that's going to allow for greater edges later down the line when you have the back pocket strategy. And then you can also start thinking more creatively to find situations where people are like deviating massively from the solver be that folding too much or aggressing too much, whatever it is. And you can just have tons of fun and find tons of profitable edges. Now you're right back into exploitative land. But if you don't have that information, then you lay back and you use your back pocket strategy and you feel confused a lot, lot less often. 
Yeah, it's so funny because actually I think one of the reasons I got so into the math of the game is I hated that feeling of confusion. You know, when I got stacked in a weird situation or I, you know, made a feel-based call on a triple barrel or something like that and, and I lost, you know, I would get obsessed with like, <laughs> what was I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> So it's. I think. I think you can leverage that. Sometimes you can leverage your, your, uh, maybe human human brain deficits, but turn them into a strength. Yeah, hundred percent agreed. But again, thank you so much for hanging out today. If you need anything at all, don't hesitate to let us know. You can always find us on social at Red Chip Poker. You can always contact me directly on Twitter at Split Suit and C War as well also on twitter to say hello to chris again thank you so much for hanging out today enjoy and we'll see you back next week with a brand new episode till next time good luck out there and happy grinding guys one last quick reminder if you're interested in that post slot workbook go to redchippoker.com slash workbook that's redchippoker.com slash workbook mm-hmm.